Welcome to The Real Deal, where it's all about businesses in central Massachusetts and northeastern Connecticut. And now, your host, Anthony Shabbat of Shabbat & Associates. Hey everybody and welcome to The Real Deal Podcast. My name is Anthony Shabbat of Shabbat & Associates Real Estate Group of Keller Williams. And on today's show, we have a really interesting guest. His name is Rick Dwanzik of Antiques Marketplace and Jeremiah's Antiques. Welcome to The Real Deal, Rick. Thanks, Tony. I appreciate it. So we have a lot of interesting things to talk about. So why don't we get started with you just telling us a little bit about yourself and your history and where you come from. Okay, so quickly, I, uh, I was born in Moosa, Connecticut. I grew up there. I owned the town pharmacy in Moosa for 20 years from 78 to 98. Um, sold that in 98, went into the antique business and have been obsessed ever since. So um, what... What type of um, tell us a little bit more about your background because we were talking before and it sounds like you have a you have a huge background uh, so that's let's let's basically repeat that conversation yeah again. yeah it's kind of crazy I I started collecting comic books in 1963 when I was eight years old yeah I'm dating myself I started collecting toys in the 80s. Uh, via a very close friend of mine uh, who was actually set up in my shop, Ron Zastowski, who was a huge toy collector. And I was obsessed since I was a kid. Um, and he and I have always been into this. So it, it's a natural type of thing to, to lead you into this. After I got out of what I did for a trade, I went into what was my, my wonderful obsession, which is antiques and collectibles, toys, comics, um, and all that kind of cool stuff. But tell us a little bit about uh, the business that you were in before you were into antiques. I love to hear the backstory. So yeah, yeah. Well, I, I my father started the pharmacy in 1948, September 1st of 48. I took over. Um, believe where, this or not, where was the pharmacy? In Moose, Connecticut. Okay, what was the name of the pharmacy? Town Pharmacy. Okay. And I took over in on September 1st of 48 of of 78, and I owned it till January 6th of 98. Um, Always was a customer relations person. We, you know, in a small town, you deal with everyone. You deal with their themselves, their parents, their uncles, their aunts, their grandparents, and uh, it it was wonderful. And I still have many of those people are my customers to this day because they remember me from that. So that's that's kind of sets the stage for what you're doing now because it gives everybody an idea of what your background is. But um, and also I should have probably mentioned this in the beginning of the podcast. But Antiques Marketplace is the crown jewel of the antiques world in um actually at one point i believe everybody referred to downtown putnam as the antiques capital of new england yeah so. yeah it sure did you know back in the early 90s uh, antiques marketplace started in 91 and back in the early 90s jerry cohen was the original owner okay and he had a vision and it was a great vision and by the mid 90s there were 17 shops in putnam um, and and to this day now there's it, it, they slowly fell away and I'll explain why in a second. But there were two shops in Putnam. There's Antiques Marketplace, which is twenty thousand square feet, one hundred thirty five dealers with four floors of antiques and collectibles. There's also Jeremiah's Antiques, which my wife and I own also, and that's five thousand square feet with about fifty dealers. Um, and what has happened in our business is this. The small shops have fallen away because it is very difficult for an individual owner to have a business and make a living out of it. It's tough. The antique business, don't let anyone kid you, is as tough as any other business there is. So you end up working the weekends, which is our bread and butter, and then you have to work a regular job during the week if you have a small shop. So then you're working seven days a week and you have to have time to find things. So it makes it very hard on the small shops. So the small shops have, over the last 12 years or so, fallen off immensely. So what's left are what we call group shops or malls, mm. and that's what we are. And those are the ones that people want to travel to because when they travel, they want to go where there's a lot of stuff. Mm. They're not going to travel to a 1,000 square foot store. They want a huge store with a lot of dealers. And luckily for us, Putnam has held that value, has held the value of having the quality and the really good product that you want to come for. The other day, we had a gentleman who was an auctioneer in Boston. He came in, he walked through our store for about two hours, and he came to me and said, this store is amazing. None of the shops that I have been to in New England can have the quality that you have. And it is extremely difficult. But my wife and I work extremely hard at getting the quality, which is not easy anymore with the internet and everything that's going on. To have good quality 
is the key. Right, in person, where you can just walk into a place and physically walk through all the different areas and see all the different types of antiques. And it seems like when you walk through here, um, there's every section somewhat has a specialty. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the specialties that you have yeah, in here? Yeah, of course. So, so we go anywhere from Mission Oak furniture from the 20s to jewelry to to 1850s to late 1700s. There are people who do collectibles. There are people who do antiques. The, the market has changed immensely. So, so it used to be that antiques were considered anything that's 100 years old. And that's, that's wonderful. And it still is wonderful. But now with the age of the collector changing, the average collector was born in the early 70s. They're in their mid 40s. Mm. Some of them don't want 1800s. They want 1950s. They want what's called mid-century modern. We've worked very hard to bring dealers in that have mid-century modern because that is what the customer wants. So as in any business, you respond to what the customer wants. And I'm going to give you an analogy that my father used when I was a kid. If you're on the street selling oranges and everybody's asking for bananas, the next day, you better have bananas yeah. because they're not buying oranges. And that's what our job is, is to recognize what the customer wants, get those kind of dealers in, work really hard to get them in, and, and the customer will make them happy. That's a great story. And actually, I've, I've heard other people say similar things. You want to sell the customer what they're looking to buy. And in, in, even in the restaurant business, you know, if, you're, if you have a bunch of customers that are asking for a certain product, then you want to be able to provide them with that type of product. You, you can't really convince them to go to go after a product that they're not interested in. Oh. You have to capture them where they're looking already. Absolutely, yeah. and yeah. you need to recognize that. And if you don't recognize that, then you're behind the curve. Mm -hmm. All there is to it. So um, there are so many things that we can talk about because you're such a huge part of downtown Putnam, and there's such a history with this particular business in downtown Putnam. I have a little piece of history that I was part of, um, and it wasn't a heck of a huge part of it, but back when the antiques business was thriving in, in Putnam, and it still is, but um, when every shop in Putnam was an antique shop, I should say, uh, I actually registered the domain name antiques, uh, PutnamAntiques.com, oh, and, cool. I, and I was trying to promote all the businesses, and I was trying to get everybody to put it on... Um, one centralized database where everybody could sell products and have their own shop um, front and all that stuff. Uh, I could never quite get everybody on board with it because a lot of the people that were in the antiques business were not internet people at that time. So it was kind of interesting, but I used to go through and take pictures and showcase all of the dealerships, uh, all the dealers' um, shops and all of the products that they had available. So it's just kind of like, a, that's one of the reasons that I'm so involved in downtown Putnam right now, because I've had that history of going from shop to shop and meeting every business owner and all that stuff. So I just wanted to say, I, I don't know anything about antiques, but at the same time, I have an interest in them just from my past and, and just sure, always, and you course. know, and, and downtown Putnam was such a great place to walk through it. It was one of my favorite things to do is just go to antique shops and just look through all the antiques and, and it was snowing in the winter time and they had all the Christmas music going on. And it was just such an awesome place to come to downtown Putnam and go antique shopping and grab a coffee somewhere and just, uh, you know, kind of get, get hot chocolate and just look for a uh, Christmas gift for people. So, you know, you know, most people who haven't gotten really, I'm not sure addicted is the right word, but I'm going to use it. <laughs> addicted to the antique business. Don't realize that the real value in the antique business is the hunt. It's going out and finding things. You know, the people we see on a regular basis, my comment is always, hey, how's the hunt? Now, I'll have people who've never done the antique and they don't know what I'm talking about. But antique guys know what the hunt is. We're out looking for stuff. We're out looking for something that appeals to us. Now, I have to tell you, the most fun of antiquing is going out looking for one thing and finding something else that is totally cool that you weren't even looking for and it's like whoa this is great man and it makes you feel good because my business is a fun business it's a good business it's no one comes into an antique antique store to buy something they need they come in to buy something that they want that makes them feel good and we're a feel-good business if you're not in this business to have fun you need to do something else, man. You need to get into accounting or whatever it is. <laughs> but antiques is about fun. It's about obsession. It's about enjoying what you're doing and going out and have a good time for an afternoon, escaping from the rest of the world and going to have fun. And when you got 25,000 square feet and 185 dealers, you can do that. And the village of Putnam, between the antiques and the great food, I'm a foodie, I'll admit it, um, 
you, you, you can come for a day and have a great time. And you add the Bradley to it, which has been written up in, in the Yankee yeah. magazine and the Boston Globe is one of the top 10 local plays, houses in, in New England. It's a lot of great stuff. I'm not saying you spend a week here, but I am saying a day or two is totally great. And there's so many events that come around through Putnam. Oh. There's there's no other town in northeastern Connecticut, and, and I'm I, I'm a really Putnam biased. I hate to add, there's no hiding it really. Uh, in northeastern Connecticut, there's no other area that you can go to a downtown, and it's a walkable downtown. There's restaurants all over the place. You know, the Fourth of July, the Performance Center, um, the River Fires, um, the First Fridays. There's just an endless supply of things to do in downtown Putnam. I literally come to downtown Putnam, and I'll park my car. I tell everybody this story over by the post office and I'll, if I have a day to spend and it's a nice day out, I'll just walk up and down the entire length of downtown Putnam and it might take me, you know, six to eight hours. I spent eight hours like a week ago, just talking to every business owner and every building owner and, and finding out what's available for lease and, um, you know, for rent and for buildings for sale and that type of thing. So, um, I just love Putnam and there's no hiding it. The, the only places that, what I always talk about is Federal Hill in Providence and Shrewsbury Street in Worcester and downtown Putnam and Mystic. That's the other one that comes to mind. When I when I think of a walkable downtown that's a really beautiful area in northeastern Connecticut and surrounding areas, those are the areas that come to mind. Well, you know, you're singing my song, and I'll tell you why you're singing my song. Because the key to a good downtown is is small individual businesses. It's the independent business person that makes it the key. Nothing against the chains, nothing against Walmart, Target, CVS, Walgreens. They're all wonderful, and they will donate to certain things in town. But to make a village go, you need the independents because they're the people who step up and do the work. It's the PBA. It's the Sheila Frosts. It's the people who are there all the time that are working to make this village go. And the chains, as wonderful as they are, don't do that. They don't have that individualism. It just doesn't work for them. They'll donate $1,000 to some big cause, right. but they won't be there to work, mm -hmm. which is okay. We take, you take what you can get, you know what I mean? But the reason this village is so good is because there's so many independent, small people doing their thing and happy to do it. And I'm also involved in the Killingly Business Association, the Woodstock Business Association, Thompson Business Association, Chamber of Commerce. So I get to see all these different organizations around northeastern Connecticut. And I wish that they could all have the enthusiasm that the Putnam Business Association has. And I think that that's what they're striving for. But for whatever reason, downtown Putnam is just a place where people's, they have a passion for the area. You better believe it. So so when I first bought, I, I bought Jeremiah's in um October of 2014, and the month after I bought it, Paul Sweet, who was the first selectman of the town of Plainfield, who I grew up with and I have first grade pictures with, came to see me and he said to me, man, Rick, I wish I had a downtown like this in Plainfield because we have the perfect setting for this wonderful thing we got going. And that doesn't always happen. You know, it's to get the perfect setting and to get the people who recognize it, it doesn't always work. Here it's working, and um, um, we're so happy to be here. We recognize it when, it when we first had the first chance, and when we got the second chance to buy Antiques Marketplace, we were like, yes, this is just a no-brainer to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's such a good place to be. I really would, I'd also like to interview Jerry Cohen. I have an interview with the mayor of Putnam tomorrow. Sure. And, uh, you know, Matt Dezonia from uh, Girardi Insurance. Yeah, good um, guy. I had an interview with Barry Jesserin from uh, 85 Mint Vanilla Bean, uh, Fenton River Grill, and uh, Dog Lane Cafe, Tony Pasiakos. You know, pretty much anybody. Um, I'm trying to get an interview with James Frost and she or Sheila Frost. Or She's wh awesome. Wh whoever's willing to talk to me. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, even... Karen at Arts and Framing across the street and Montero, anybody that wants to do one of these podcasts, I feel like everybody has their own. The way I like to look at it is um, everybody has a lens that they see the world through and specifically people in this area, of course, they're all going to have their own uh, vision of the way Putnam could be or the you know what they're, what's happened in Putnam and the way that they see Putnam. So it's interesting to interview people. I love doing this. It gives me kind of a one-on-one -on -one well, opportunity. You know, I, I'm so glad you said that because when you walk out the door, you see certain things that Ann, or, Ann is doing and then you go to the next one, you see something they're doing and it's all that kind of stuff that works together that makes this wonderful collage right. and, and that's what this is about. It's a collage. It's not one person doing the thing. It's a group of us doing something and we're doing it independently but we're also doing it within each other mm -hmm. but it's a little bit looser and that's what makes it all work and yeah. and it's just such a good way to do things because 
how can I say this? It offers a variety that none of us know is coming. And but it's there. And it's this <laughs> magical thing that appears and it's like, holy moly, this actually happened. Totally cool. Car shows. Oh, the first car show, Fridays. Yeah. All these things just mesh together and you get done saying, Wow, that was really cool. Fire and ice. Oh yeah, another one. Oh, Fire and ice. Oh my god, yeah, Fire and show. ice is such a good thing with all the ice carving and everything. You know, just a wonderful event that really rolls and it happens kind of almost on its own. It's really not on its own. Sheila works her butt off. All these people work their butts off, <laughs> but it happens and we're like, wow, cool. So um, another person that I've been working heavily recently is uh, Christina and Dave Anderson from Victoria Station Cafe and they're luckily they're so willing to allow me to use their second floor for a lot of the things that I do including recording the podcast and having the first Wednesday's real estate events and stuff like that so thank you so much to those two that couldn't I can't thank them enough they've been awesome to work with and um, you know so I I guess we should probably get, try to get back on track because we're I'm really sorry. <laughs> I get rolling man well that's it's just what happens when you get into a conversation with somebody that's passionate about what they're talking about um, um, so why don't you tell us a little bit more about we, we talked a little bit of your background with the pharmacy and then you sold the business and then you how did you come to Putnam what brought you into Putnam originally well, okay so so my wife Lori and I my, my wonderful wife Lori Flannery who who is is my spouse for the last 10 years um, we met I was the I when I got involved in the antique business I moved into a shop in 2001 I was selling online on eBay the first time I sold on eBay was June 7th of 1998 and I was selling online and finding stuff and going to people's houses and selling comics and toys and I decided I wanted to set up at a shop so I set up at the Greenville Antique Center which is in Greenville Rhode Island it's an 18,000 square foot group shop in a big old mill and I started working there. Well, by 2003, I became the manager. And from 2003 to 2009, I was the manager, which is where I met my now wife, Lori. She was there set up and she worked there. And the more you become immersed in this business, the more you learn. The more you see, the more you learn. The more you do, the more you learn. So we were doing that and we were set up in four shops. And we were set up here in Antiques Marketplace. We were set up at Jeremiah's. We were set up at Surbridge Antiques. And we were set up at the Greenville Antique Center. And by set up, I mean we rented space and we did our own little business out of that space. And we would run ads and people would call us and we'd go to the houses. And I was, I'm a certified appraiser, USPAP certified. So I do appraisals, but I'd also buy things, find things for museums. And, and my job was to go out and hunt stuff, just like you see on TV. Um, and when we were set up next door, that shop became available. And we said to ourselves, the kids are older now. Let's do it. So we bought that shop. And we bought that shop in October of 2014. Come fast forward to uh, January of, I've got to think about this now, 16, and Mr. Cohen came to see us and said, I want to retire. I'm done. I'm going to get out. And if someone doesn't buy my shop, I'm going to close the shop and sell the property to a developer because I'm done. I can't, I just don't want to put the time in anymore. So we talked about it and we said, you know what? This is a good opportunity for us. It includes the business plus the property, which now gives us a home because we now lease that property next door at Jeremiah's. So we came and did this. It's been a lot of work um, and it's turned out wonderful. But like anything else, the first six months, if I had hair, I would have pulled it all out. <laughs> Thank God I don't. I know the feeling. Yeah, okay. So, and it's been a lot of work and, and, I need to make this very clear to everyone out there listening. My wife and I are a team. She does, seven, she runs 75% of this business. She does all the booking of all the rentals. She does all the employees. She does all that. I joke with people and say, she's the brains and I'm the beauty, which is really not true. She's both. But um, it has worked out to be extremely well. I tend to be more the chatty guy, more the person to greet the customers. I remember them. I remember what they buy. I remember what they're from. She's the nuts and bolts. And without that, it wouldn't happen. Luckily, we can be together 24-7 and survive. A lot of couples can't do that, but we can. And it has just worked out tremendously well. Um, we have a good group of people that we have support staff mm -hmm. that we can count on. Um, and we can, when we need to take time off, which we don't take much, but when we do, um, we know that 
they're going to make a good decision. And whatever decision they make, they know that we're going to back them 100%. Mm -hmm. There's a give and take to having employees mm -hmm. and people that work for you. And we're just extremely happy to be in this village. Um, when we got into this village back in 2014, we said, you know, this place is really putting it together. And the people that we talk to have the same idea we do. And maybe not exactly, but they're going in the same direction. And that's very, very important. Um, and, I, you know, when I, when I do my advertising and when I promote this village, I mean everything I say. It is not hoopucky. It is the truth. I think this place is great. I can recommend to you right now five restaurants that I guarantee you you will be happy with. Oh, yeah. I can recommend shops that you can go in that the people will be nice and pleasant and you'll enjoy yourself. How much better can you get? And it's all close to central Massachusetts, Rhode Island. The casinos are, you know... South of Hartford's oh. an hour away, so <clears throat> it's a great. It's definitely a great area to be in. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so uh, let's get into. I know we we went over your background, then we went over the Jeremiah's purchase, yeah. and then let's talk about the Antiques Marketplace building. A little okay. Bit. So the Antiques Marketplace building is the old Bugby Department Store. I used to go there when my grandmother. We all did, did, man. I'll <laughs> tell you what. Upstairs, down and back was the Husky Department. I remember very well. Okay. You, I, I, don't, I don't believe that. I was a Husky kid. Okay. So, so the thing is, is they started building the building in 1891. They uh, uh, late 1891. They opened in early 1894, um, and they stayed in business till 1988. And wow. it was very successful, and it was a wonderful business, and everybody came to Bugby's. I grew up in Moosup, so we would come to Bugby's and shop because they had everything. I remember coming up here for Easter clothes. I remember coming up here for back-to-school clothes, and it was a place to come. It's a wonderful big old building. It's a big old building, but it is a beautiful old building. It is. And it's, we've got a total of 20,000 square feet here, which is four floors. And it's just, you know, even if you don't come in and buy anything, if you just walk around and look at the building, it is amazing, you know, that this building is is still sitting here with this wonderful tin ceiling and the hardwood floors and all these wonderful things that they put in in the 1890s. I mean, it's a wonderful experience just to walk through. Even, you know, even if you like come up here and say, I'm going to have a bite to eat, I'm going to eat it. Uh, Victoria Station or I'm going to go to 85 Main or the courthouse and I'm just going to kind of walk through and look at all the great cool stuff that I remember having a kid or my mother had or my grandmother had. It's a fun day. You don't have to buy anything. Yeah. We never expect that. And and the other thing is if you come to Putnam in at sunset, this is what I always recommend to everybody. If you can come to downtown Putnam between spring and fall, right at about right before sunset, half an hour before sunset. <clears throat> this area is just one of the most beautiful areas I've ever seen anywhere. When that sunset is on, on the mark, it is just unbelievable. And if you're having dinner out on the patio or if you're walking up and down the street and you know you hear the music as you're going by the stores, and it's just uh, it's a pretty beautiful place. And then we have the Pumpkin Fest and uh, the other events I'm thinking you know, are coming along, the train coming in. and Two trains. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful. The trains are wonderful. Now, one is timed on the Pumpkin Fest day and the other one is not, okay? But they're both great and they're great fun. And if you love to ride the train, one, I believe, comes out of Woodsocket, one comes out of Norwich and, yeah. and they're just wonderful to do, okay? The Pumpkin Fest is awesome. There's just tons of great stuff to do here. I'm, you know, I'm not saying you come and rent a motel for two days, but you want to come up for a day and have a really good time. Putnam's a great place to come. And I, you know, I got to tell you, I'm going to say this and the Bradley theater is wonderful. We, I took my oh, father, is. my father yeah. was 80. I took him last year to the Buddy Holly story. He loved it. We took him to the Buddy Holly concert, uh, what, two months ago? He loved it again. And it's beautiful in there, oh, too. Oh, my God. And you know what the best part about the Bradley is, and most people don't get this, and I live in Sutton, which is near Worcester, oh, Mass. I didn't know that. Yeah, and I we're members that. of the Hanover, oh, the Hanover. And the Hanover has wonderful shows, but the Hanover is big. The Bradley is a small, wonderful little venue that no matter what's going on, wherever you are, you feel like you're part of it. Where I'm not viewing it, I'm in it. And I'm telling you, the Bradley just really 
just makes it happen and it immerses you. It literally immerses you in what's going on. If you wanted to go to a drama, if you want to go to a musical, if you want to go to a comedy, you are literally part of the show. And that's the best. Yeah. I saw Beauty and the Beast there with my daughters when they were... Well, actually, I don't think that we even had my second daughter yet. But um, we went to go see Beauty and the Beast there. It was the best performance that I've... It was one of the best performances I've ever seen anywhere. I really thought... I felt like it could have been... Some of the people that were in it could have easily been on Broadway. If they're not now, they they yeah. they probably could have been at the time even. Yeah. And it was just... They, it was so well put together. Um, so I can't say enough thing, enough great things about the Bradley Playhouse. Um, so, and there's, that place has um, got a lot of events going on throughout the year and, and they changed too. the, the comedy shows over there. I was, I was amazed that, uh, they can get a little yeah, risky. Yeah. Yeah. yeah little... Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> but you know what? That's the great thing. And I think they sell drinks and stuff yeah, like that. It's a little <laughs> something for everybody. Right, you yeah. know what I mean? So I look at this village and, and you're going to laugh at me, but again, I'm a foodie. I look at it as a, as a, as a Sunday, you know what I mean? You got your ice cream, you got your brownies, you got, and there's so much stuff that you put together that you have this flavor that cannot be duplicated because it's a combination of many things. And, and that's what we got going here. And, it's just wonderful to be part of it. I like being part of that flavor. I love your enthusiasm. I like being one of those flavors. You're you know one of the mean? most enthusiastic people that I've ever met. Well, I think. well it's great thanks, to, it's but great I, to I love what I do, and yeah, I'm yeah, very, yeah. very fortunate that I can make a living and send my kids, two boys, to college <laughs> on this wonderful living that I'm, I'm very fortunate to have, you know? Well, um, we should get back on track to Rick Dwanzik and Antiques Marketplace and Jeremiah. So yeah. um, when you moved, for, or you didn't move, you still own the Jeremiah's expanded. building. So you expanded and you purchased the Antiques Marketplace you building from it. Jerry Cohen, yeah. um, who was instrumental in Putnam, period, like, you know, from, from start to finish, yeah, all Putnam the success of Putnam. Putnam and there's no p thing about Putnam that Jerry Cohen should not be part of. Right, exactly. Okay. Yeah, I'm look looking forward to interviewing him, too, because I'd, I'd love to hear what he yeah. has to say about this his story of this building too yeah. it'd be interesting to listen to that um but let's get into the purchase of this building yep. how long ago was that what, what year did that you was december of 2000 like i think this 2016 oh wow so pretty recently a couple years uh, ago uh, yeah a year and whatever nine months right yeah and um so you had your eye on it when you were at Jeremiah's. Yep. And then when it, when Jerry said that it was available. So, yeah. so he used to own Jeremiah's too then? No, no. Who used to own Jeremiah's? It was two other people. I, I, there were two other people before I bought it that owned it. I guess three other people. Um, and the last two just did not develop it. Um, I remember when Pevner's used to be yeah, over there. Of and, you, I, and the Imperial Theater, uh, theater was of, where of course, cinemas were. Of course, were sure. Bradley. So you'd go into... Uh, Pevner's beforehand yeah. and uh yeah no Pevner's was great and I, I knew the Pevner's <laughs> very well they went to school with my father believe it or not University of Connecticut back in the 30s yeah. um and they had a restaurant in the back yes of that. they did they had, well I think it was called a town restaurant or yeah. something okay um and they, they were extremely nice people um and Jeremiah's turned into this wonderful antique store this is going to go on for hours we we really have to make sure that we stay on track because yeah, we, yeah, well, we are literally going to be here for like two yeah, hours well, I think however it works I'm sorry <laughs> so so anyway so so when we took over over this place, we decided that we needed to make some changes. Mm -hmm. And what had happened is, believe it or not, in 2010, 2011, when we were set up here, Lori and I both worked here. And um, we were here for about a year. And then we stopped working here and went off doing other things. When we had the chance to purchase this business, we wanted to make some, some changes to it, some things that we felt needed modernizing, mm -hmm. some things that we needed to do to make it different than what it was because we felt it needed to be different from what it was. Modernizing, modernizing how? What, what were your Product. Thinking? Yeah. Product is, so, so again, I want to, I want to mention something. Yeah. I, and I've said it once, but I'll say it again. The average collector now was born in the early 70s. They're in their mid to late 40s. Their memories of things are different than my memories of things. I was born in 55. Mm -hmm. So what I played with and what means something to me is different from what means to them. And this business is built upon memories. So we needed to update the type of product. Yes, we needed stuff that was still antique and we needed stuff that was 100 years old. But you know what? We also needed stuff from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Now, most antique stores in the, in the past have always been resistant to that because they feel antiques should be 100 years old, yeah. and I got it. But the problem is, is that the antique business is not what it used to be. The antique business is what it is now, and what it is now is antiques and collectibles. And 
things from the 50s, 60s, and 70s sell extremely well. And that's just the way it is. Don't get me wrong. I, I love it. My, my house is 1850s and earlier. Mm -hmm. But that's mine. Not the new collector. The new collector wants stuff from the 40s, from the 50s, from the 60s, from the 70s, and even some of it from the 80s. They're Transformers. Oh, yeah. They're G.I. Joes. It's just the way it is. There's a and, Facebook page called That's Classic.net. I don't know if you've seen that one. But, I have not. But there's all kinds of 80s memorabilia that goes on there all the time, and it really does bring back memories of when I was you growing up. You better believe it. And, and quickly, so, so back in the early 90s when I was doing toy shows, I would take the 12-inch G.I. Joes that I played with, and I would sell them at these shows. And I would sell the G.I. Joes naked, no clothes on them, and they would sell for $80 to $120. Wow. That's what they sold for. Now... In this day's market, with the eBay and everything else, and the age change, the average GI Joe sells for around thirty-five dollars. Wow! And it's because the collector who collected that is older; they're not collecting it. Mm -hmm. The new collector is collecting the GI Joes that start in '83, which are the three and three-quarter inch, mm -hmm. not the big ones. They're more desirable now because of the age of collector has changed. We have this generational change that you have to accept. Time marches on. Well, I remember when I used to go around and look at antiques all the time, I mean, we were just basically looking for anything that was somewhat affordable that we could put in our house and call it an antique and decorate our house with antiques. That was that was kind of our goal. When we moved to Putnam in 2003 and we would come to downtown Putnam and we wanted to just decorate our house with all antiques all over the place. And we actually were pretty successful at it. But um, it was it's funny because it wasn't cheap and then eventually at some point we made a transition to go in a different direction but um it seemed like that's what everybody was doing at one time i don't know if everybody does that now or if, if it's just different groups of people that i see or more people listen don't get me wrong people still want antiques mm -hmm. but there are more people looking for cool stuff mm -hmm. they want something that's cool they want something that's unusual something that's different something that when they look at it it gives them this good feeling inside mm. because our business is an inside type of thing. How I bought this, how does it make me feel? Again, no one is buying something that they need. They're buying something that makes them feel good. They're buying something to add to their collection. Mm. They're buying this great fun. They come here to have fun. So can you think of some certain, some specific items that are you know really popular right now oh absolutely yeah, so okay. so within the last six week we six weeks we have sold three mid-century modern bars now you say wow what is that well that is the bar back in the 50s and early 60s they created these bars that you could have in your home and they they basically fold up and they look like this this little small bureau but when you open the tops up there's Formica, you open the doors up, there's all the glasses and there's all these bottle holders that have your liquor and you would mix your drinks on top of this when you had your friends over. Huge, huge item, okay? Um, cocktail shakers. Now, I will say this, cocktail shakers started with Prohibition because they were making bathtub gin and they needed to make it taste good because it tasted so horrible, so they came up with cocktail shakers. But cocktail shakers and all the glass sets from the late 50s and early 60s, which are, were have an ice bucket and glasses and a cocktail shaker with it, extremely popular right now. Liquor, uh, alcohol, how could I say this? Bar items is better. I don't want to say liquor, I don't want to say alcohol. Bar items are really hot right now. Really good item. Another item that is extremely strong, which goes back a long way, the coin market. If you collect coins, we have so many people coming in the store, so many fathers and grandfathers buying coins for their kids. They're building this collectible market. If I was going to start this all over again and I was going to look at it as a businessman, I'd probably get in the coin business oh, wow. because I see the future of the coin market. We have coins going back to, believe this or not, you know, 40 BC. I know yeah. that sounds crazy, but we got them. They're still digging them up over what's, in Europe. What's the most famous coin everybody always talks about? I think is it the Buffalo nickel or something like that? Well, there, there's an it. there's there's a um, a nickel that was produced that's an inverted nickel. That's that's there's a three million dollar bounty on. <laughs> Who knows where that is? <laughs> you know, there's lots of great coins. Yeah. Era coins are very valuable where they made a mistake and it still got out. They didn't catch it. But the coin market's extremely strong. And it's a really good thing. If you want to get your kids into collecting, it's a good thing to start. Believe this or not, comic books 
and toys are extremely strong. Comic books, people really relate to comic books. When you were a kid, if you read a comic book, it was designed to take you away. It took you someplace else. For that 15 or 20 minutes that you read the book, it took you away. Oh, yeah. And that's very valuable to us. That place that we went, wherever it was, Never Neverland or whatever it was, is very valuable because at some point in our lives, we had to get a job, we had to go to college, we had to come out of college, we had to get, we got married, we had kids, we got lots of responsibilities. <laughs> we remember that period. It was a free period. It was freeing to be back there. And and people collect that. They they do that for their for to remember it because every time you look at it, you remember that time. And that was a cool time. So do you have special events throughout the year here at Antiques Marketplace that you can talk about? Um, well, we have some, but but our special events are a little bit different, okay? We always have Customer Appreciation Weekend, and that'll be the first weekend in October. And we have that catered. Believe it or not, one of the people that work for us used to be a caterer. He's retired now, mm -hmm. but he caters that for us. And we have sales and, and all kinds of stuff. And that's always the first weekend in October. During the year, we coincide sales to kind of blend with other things that are going on. We, of course, have a Valentine's sale because Valentine's is a very important time. People are buying presents for each other. Brimfield, when Brimfield comes along, we always have Brimfield sales because Brimfield, for people who aren't uh, knowledgeable about Brimfield, Brimfield is probably the largest antique and collectible flea market on the East Coast, and it's 40 minutes north of us oh yeah people, so i hear people talking about it all the time yeah brimfield's a wonderful i drive thing. through there on a regular basis i've yeah. been shopping it for 35 years mm -hmm. um so we coincided with that our business is not built upon specials and sales because it's built upon the desire to go out and find something mm -hmm. and that's within each person that comes and shops with us so having big events doesn't always work in what we do mm -hmm. um I'm just curious if you have like a, you know some special appraiser antiques roadshow or some yeah, kind of like a yeah we we don't we don't do that and, okay and yeah. it's funny that you mentioned that because within the last two weeks I've been invited to do two of those at two different churches and I used to do those and I found that they're not as successful as you wish they were mm -hmm. okay um, when we watch Antiques Roadshow on TV, I don't know if you watch that. I love the show. I, I've seen it many times. Yeah, yeah. And, and I like it because I learn a lot about stuff. Right. It is interesting to see. It is interesting, but most people don't realize. So when they did the one in Hartford a few years ago, they sold 10,000 tickets because they limit. You buy a ticket. You're allowed to bring two items. That was 20,000 items that they viewed during that weekend. They showed about 64 of them on TV. Oh, yeah. So it shows you the percentage of product that is okay. I have a friend that went to it. Both his items, they said, well, they're not valuable, but as long as you like them, that's okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. People go with these, with these feelings that I have this item, it's old, and I believe it's valuable. And that's good. The problem is, is most of the time, and I, I hate to say it this way, but most of the time their items are more valuable as a memorabilia for them, for their memory of their aunt, their uncle, their grandmother, right, yeah. than actual dollar value. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Okay. I have a friend that, um, it's interesting to think about this because it just popped into my brain he, a long time ago. I think, I don't know if it's real or not, but he, he claimed to have a, like a Salvador Dali sketch or something like that. He, they did a lot of it, Salvador Dali prints. They redid them over again. Yeah. And they've been done multiple times. But and I was always curious. Them. That would be one thing that I would love to, for him to take it to um, one of those types of things and get some sort of an appraisal from yeah, it. Yeah, to find out what yeah. it is. You, do you, know? you guys don't do that type of thing here, do you? Well, not usually. Okay. I mean, I have people come in. So I see 50 to 60 people a week wanting to have me look at stuff. Mm. And most of the times they want to sell things, okay? And they bring this stuff in hoping it has value and want to sell it. On average, I buy for two or three. Because most of the stuff, like it or not, is just stuff. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's just the way it is. And a lot of it is older and the market is not there anymore for it. A lot of the people that collected things in the last 30, 40 years, the market has changed so much. 
more than it has in years that a lot of that stuff is just not desirable. You can't find people who want it. So where can you go to find out what are the hot antiques? Like if I wanted to go to Brimfield and sort through all the different places that you can look for stuff over there, or if I wanted to go to a, an estate sale and I'm trying to keep my eyes open for certain things, where can I learn what to look for? Well, you know, the internet now is the key. It used to be we all had books. I mean, I have over 300 reference books that I use, but now the internet is the key. You need to use the internet. You need to research stuff out. In our business, there are people who are trying to get into it all the time. And what our business is, is for, for lack of a better term, gambling. But we gamble with our knowledge. So my knowledge, my learning what things are going for and what things are good and what things are bad helps me when I go out into the marketplace to buy. I say, oh, I've had one of those before and I sold it for $100. So I know that what that is worth and what they're asking for is a fair price or not a fair price. It's mostly trial and error, to be very honest with you. In a way, it's kind of like houses because somebody can list it for whatever they want to list it for. But um, what really matters is how much have houses that are similar sold for in the area. Yeah. Well, I'm, so. I'm glad you said that because here's a very important warning for everyone, anyone who's listening, okay? You can go on the internet and you can look up any item you want. And you can look it up and you can see what people are asking for it. But what you really need to see is what people are selling them for, what they actually sell for. And I'm going to give you an example. I had a girl two months ago contact me and said she had a very valuable Beanie Baby. And I said to her, gee, I don't know of any valuable Beanie Babies, but you may be right. So send me some photos and I'll do some research. She said, oh yeah, this is very valuable. So she sends me the Beanie Baby. I go online. I go to eBay. My first stop always. And I look at what people are asking first. Do you look up buy it now or do you look up, um, what do you, how do you search? For well, things? no, I first, I'll explain to you. Yeah. So first I start with what people are asking. So there's a man, believe it or not, asking $4,500 for this Beanie Baby. Now I follow it down. Somebody's asking $2,500. Somebody's asking 250. Somebody's asking 50. Same Beanie Baby. Same exact Beanie okay. Baby. Tag everything. Same year, everything. <laughs> so now I decide, okay, now I'm going to go to sold searches. Yeah. What did it really sell for? Right. It sold for $6 with free shipping. Wow. But you can ask anything you want. So everyone out there has to remember, eBay is the largest fishing pond in the world. And there's people throwing bait in the water all the time. And they're hoping that they find a wife who's buying something for her husband or a husband is buying something for their wife or they need to buy something for their child and it's, their birthday is in two days and they need it now. So they're going to pay whatever they can get for it to get it. If it's the only one available and they need that item, it's a good sale for them. Yeah, it is. I have a few items for sale on, on eBay right now. Just camera equipment that I yeah. haven't used in a long time. It's been sitting around. I put my daughters on the job and they, they throw it up there and so, so it sells I'll, all the time. I'll give you a quick story. Years ago, a few years ago when Tim Tebow was playing for Denver, my youngest uh, was a Tebow fan and he wanted Tim Tebow's jersey. So we went on and uh, last minute, of course, as usual with kids, <laughs> we go on and we look and we see they're selling for $185 on eBay. And I said, well, I need to do some more research. Within an hour, I found the company in China that produced the, t the, the, the jersey the same exact for, ones, this, right? for Reebok yeah. <laughs> with the Reebok yeah. logo on it. Yeah. And I bought it for $28 and they shipped it to me. Wow. That is, that is incredible. And I just did a little research. It wasn't yeah. much. Same thing with Patriots jerseys. Oh, like absolutely. The, <laughs> the same exact company. They yeah. made it for Reebok. Reebok right. never made those. They just put their name on it. Right. And, and this is very, very common. Um, so research is very important in our business. The phone has changed our business immensely. Okay. People, 50% of all the customers that come into my shop have their phone in their hand mm. and they're looking up prices online. Right. Now, the only issue with online is it's hard to tell condition. You really, some of these items you really need to have in hand to be able to tell condition because grading, what an item is graded at, if it's perfect, if it's mint, if it's near mint, if it's very fine, if it's very good, all that makes a difference. And beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So one person may think a person, an item's mint, where me might say, well, that's just very good. What are some of the items that are here at Antiques Marketplace that you would have a hard time finding in other areas? Or, or you know, what are some of the items that you have here that are that really stand out? Because I remember when I was talking to Jerry Cohen a long time ago, I think they had, was it, 
I don't even know the name of it. A certain type of uh, the furniture back there, the Shaker furniture. No, he, okay. So, so Jerry Cohen, Jerry Cohen's big thing is Mission Oak, and that's from the early 1900s. And that was from you know California for the bung, bungalow, uh, uh, the bungalow houses, and it's beautiful stuff. And that's very special. You just don't find that any place. And he has a he has a good selection of it, and we have it in this shop. Um, we have a lot of great sterling silver jewelry. We have a lot of early pottery and glassware. The thing that, that sets us apart from any other shop is the wide range of product we have and the wide range of quality product where you might go into one shop and they will have one thing, but they won't have other things. So between the two shops, I can tell you that you can find early pottery. You can find 1800s glassware. You can find gas pumps. You can find gas station signs from the 50s and 60s. You can find oil signs. You can find uh, steampunk. You can find so many different things in our shop. Mm. Nice quality things ranging from the late 1700s all the way up into the 80s that you just don't find other places. And that's the key to us, is that the variety we offer, that we want to offer, we, we know we're offering this. We actually bring people in with that variety on purpose because that's the key. So um, as I look around here, it seems like there's not a lot of space for anybody else that wants to come in and, and uh, take up some space. Do you have any availability for uh, people that are looking for space? Okay, I'm glad you asked that. So so what happens is our, our gig, what we do is we rent space to people mm -hmm. and they run their own little business within that. I can tell you that in both shops, the only available space we have are cases right now. Um, you would need to speak to my wife more because she <laughs> handles that and we never get into each other's jobs. But... Um, Booths right now are at a premium, though we're taking names from people, and we always like to see if what you have, and if you have something good, we're always looking for a way to fit you in. So when you say booths um, and you say cases, do you mean um, these glass cases, they're display cases? Yeah, and they're display cases, and they, and... and they lock, okay? Mm, okay? And they run anywhere from $57.50 up to $105, depending upon size, and that is where most people start. They experiment with it. They try it in a case. It's the least amount of investment. Mm -hmm. It needs to be said that this is a business. And if you want to do well, you need to be in, change your product, move things around, recognize things that don't sell, change prices. It is not like I'm just going to put it in and people are going to come in and love my stuff. Mm -hmm. I always warn people, it's an immense amount of fun. It's also an immense amount of work. You know, it's interesting. I was just thinking about this. Sometimes I do virtual tours for people. And do you, do you guys have a virtual tour of the interior? No, but it's something we've talked about and we thought it would be great for on Facebook. I do that. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay. I literally have the best camera to do that. Oh, okay. It's called the Matterport camera. And I'm not really giving myself a promotion here. And I'd be actually willing to come in here and do one for free for you guys. Just to, just to show off uh, the potential, the capabilities, there's a virtual reality goggles that you can put on. And you can literally feel like you're in the place. Oh, that's cool. Around. I'd love it. Um, because the great thing about that, what just hit me, is um, people from California or Florida or anywhere in the world could get a virtual tour of, and they could actually see the products up close and it's almost like they would be there anybody that hasn't had a chance to come here recently or maybe somebody that's paralyzed or somebody in a wheelchair or something like that that it's hard for them to get out they could they could potentially see what it looks like if we did something like that so well I, that's i'm a, glad that's a you said that for you because <laughs> now it's summertime and people are traveling right and we're getting tons of people from other places in the country and even out of the country that come here and we get the one thing we get from all of them is that they don't have anything like this where they are right yeah they really don't it is extremely difficult to find two shops next door to each other 25,000 square feet, that much stuff, anywhere. And, you know, it, it, it flabbergasts me because I look at this as like, this is the way it should be. So to me, it's natural. But to them, it's like, whoa, this place is so cool. I can't believe this. And, and we love it. We had a couple who came in the other day. They lived in New York City. They just bought a house in Darien. They came in and they bought five Oriental rugs, early Persian rugs, and they did because she remembered that her parents used to come here and get them. Actually, let's, that gives me an idea. Let's, would you mind walking around with yeah, me for a sure, little bit? Yeah. I want to take a look <clears throat> as we walk in the front door over here. I'm going to talk about some of the things that I see. So as we're in downtown Putnam, Victoria Station's across the street, um, Fine Carpet Studios across sure. the street. 
Um, Arts and Framing, they're moving down the street, so that space is going to be open. But coming in the front door of Antiques Marketplace here, when you first walk in, the first thing that I see, <clears throat> a big open space. Um, there's coins and there's frames and there are um, shelves that hold a bunch of different things that we were just talking about. There's furniture all over the place. There's a spinning wheel over there. Um, all kinds, pretty much anything that you can imagine. There's a one-way sign. There's a deer head on the wall back over there. All kinds of artwork all over the place in a beautiful building with tin ceilings. And so there's, this is the main floor that we're in. I can see there's a second floor going up. And then there's a humongous amount of space on the second floor. There's also a basement over here, right? So, yeah. So yeah. let me give you the quick spiel I give to everyone when it's the first time they're here, yeah. okay? So our first floor is where we keep... As far as furniture goes, the higher end, more antique furniture, okay? Um, and the first floor consists of basically three rooms. The main room here, wh where we have the birch room back there, we have the ash room, and we have the walnut room. When you go up the stairs to the second floor, the second floor is twice the size of the first floor. Right, yeah. It's then huge. at the back of the second floor, we have what's called the mezzanine. Now, our mezzanine is like, a, uh, for lack of a better term, a filings basement. You'll find the lower prices. You'll find vintage clothing mm -hmm. and things like that up there. Our basement is not a basement. It's got really good stuff in it. So with everything going on, you can spend two or three hours here walking through and looking at everything easily and spend lots of time here. Take a break, go get a good meal, come back, okay? Um, the main floor here where we are will always be your little bit more upper end product. It's just, it's just the, real, the way it is. The real showcase items that you want to Absolutely. Yeah, you okay. Take the spotlight. Now, yeah. Now, Jeremiah's is a little bit easier than that. It's, it's an oblong um, 5,000 square feet. It has, it's going to be more for what we use. The term we call is called mantiki. <laughs> M-A-N-T-I-K-I, okay? And it's because you're going to find a lot more gas station pumps, advertising signs, guy stuff, license plates, toys, comics. You do find antiques. You do find jewelry. You find gold. You find coins. But the mix is different than here. The mix is more towards the guy. And we did that on purpose. Um, and it's worked out really well for us. I have people who come in here and say, I love this store. I have people who go to Jeremiah's and say, I like this one better. It doesn't make a difference because they're really the same store to us. It's all about what you're looking for. Yeah, oh, exactly. <clears throat> Specifically, exactly. you can you can have your own. And, and there's something for everybody, too. Oh, my um, gosh. The grandfather's clocks. There's old clocks over here. What's this thing right here, this this red thing right there? It looks like some sort of a oh, engine that's, or that's coffee That's an early mill. 1800s coffee grinder. Coffee grinder. Oh, it's totally awesome. Let's go take a look at this and talk yeah. about that for a minute. I like yeah. to, I like narrowing it down yeah. to like a yeah, specific that's a, item. That's a coffee grinder. That's and you, they neat. put a few gr – oh, yeah, it's totally great. And you can see where you put the beans in here. You'd spin the handles. So it's a red coffee grinder. There's a couple of wheels on uh, – there's a wheel on each so, side. Well, of and it. a handle here to turn it. Okay, and to grind handle, the coffee. Okay, okay. So, yeah. But here's the, here's the deal. The reason this is, item is so nice is you rarely find them with all this great paint on it. This is original paint. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this paint is probably 135 years old or more. And you just don't find them like this. Coffee grinders are a real collector site. It seems to be There's really popular. They're People, all over the place oh on eBay and God. stuff, you know, in, in, yeah. in Antiques Marketplace. But yeah. I remember my ex-wife and I used to um, love coffee. I mean, huge espresso fans and making your own coffee at home with the French press and all that stuff. So... The coffee grinders are really a neat thing to find. There was always this one that I would look up and I would see this this one particular one and I always wanted it. I just never ended up buying it, but yeah. it was just so cool. I just you, you never want, had that extra money to spend yeah. on that you cool item. You understand the person who buys this is not going to use it. Mm -hmm. He's going to use this special coffee grinder as a centerpiece to his collection among his other 50 or 60. And I know that sounds crazy. You say 50 <laughs> or 60 coffee grinders. But let me tell you, our collecting... It's, it's, it fulfills something within you. So are there people that have 50 or 60 coffee grinders, and what do they do with them? Where do they put them? They display them. At their house? Oh, God, yes. They have that I mean, many okay, so, so I, need to, I need to say something to you, okay? <laughs> when I finally, I'm not from that world, so... I, 
my t- when I topped my collection of comic books, it was forty thousand comic books. Wow! I know, I know, <laughs> and I sold them. I sold them all, but but it was great, and I and I was one of the lucky ones. I started collecting at eight years old. My parents let me keep them, so you can understand how that volume goes. <laughs> but there are people who have forty thousand. Forty thousand. My good. my wife collects French enamel. We have to have 250 pieces of French enamel. Well, I don't even know what French enamel is. What is that? Okay, so French enamel is, is enamel that was produced, this metalware that was coated with enamel in France in the 1800s. Mm-hmm. My wife went to college in Paris at the El Sabon, and she just loved it, so she collects it. We have it all over our kitchen. And what, what type of a kitchen items are coated in the enamel? Oh, my God. So pitchers, um, funnels, uh, teapots, coffee pots, uh, all kinds of plates, bowls. That's funny. I used to know somebody that was really adamant about enamel yeah. kitchen items, and it was it was like this is the best quality. You have to have the enamel kitchen item. I've got a huge. Co- I have a huge collection of bowls, <laughs> old eighteen hundreds bowls. Not a huge, seventy or eighty pieces, mm-hmm. not big, yeah. but. And and we're just, you know, the collector loves that. He loves to find something different that he hasn't found before. It, again, is about the hunt. There are people who collect only advertising. Yeah, so I've we see this icy pie, mm-hmm. you know, this little advertising thing, piece. And it was a, uh, this was probably a display in an in a, in a old general store. And there are people who collect advertising. There are people who collect circus. I mean, look at this Barnum & Bailey's early circus poster. They... they it's not. Oh yeah, 1917. It's 101 years old. Mm. Tell me, it's not awesome. Look at the colors on that. You know, how can you? Even if you're not into it, how can you look at that and not say that's totally cool? <laughs> oh, it is very cool. Yeah. I love that stuff. And then there's the wooden ducks over here, and I see there. Yeah, those are decoys. Decoys are extremely collectible. Okay. This is a this is a child's cradle. This is European. You never see the design like this. In the United States, it was the United States. We were much more functional. This is you can see the design is just wonderful, and it's it's European. It's just got such a great look. This is a kitchen cabinet. This is where they so would keep all their stuff, and they would can, work here. Where can people go to see some of these these items that we're talking about? We should have mentioned it in the beginning of the podcast, but um, what is where can where would you recommend people to go? The best place for them to go to find any of these things we're talking about. In antique and collectible shops. Okay, it's the so, only place yeah. you're going to find them now. They're, they're not any place else. But where can people go You know, if they're at their computer and they, they're listening oh, to the podcast? Okay, okay. They want to look it up online and just ch- take a look and see yeah, if yeah. you so, have Yeah, so there's a few things to do. You can always look on eBay. There are, tons of, there are tons of websites now. There's Ruby Lane. There's Etsy. What about Antiques Marketplace items specifically? Facebook or is there a... Yeah, no, we put stuff on Facebook all the time. <clears throat> we put photos of things on Facebook only time. Mm-hmm. But here's the one problem with that. We put stuff on Facebook, they come in the next day and buy it. And it's gone, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let so you never you. have updated inventory online. It's because impossible because it, it always sells. Yeah. The other, uh, uh, 10 days ago, I went to a house and I bought a 1934 Mills um, Castle Front slot machine. Mm-hmm. I put it on, I brought it in, cleaned it up, I put it on the next day, and I just, for the fun of it, put it on Facebook for people to see it. Mm. I had five calls in two days. Because of Facebook? Right. Now, yeah. the problem was is I sold it in one day because somebody walked in and goes, <laughs> I never see those. I'm buying it. So you had to delete I had it to read. I had to tell people that it was sold <laughs> okay, because right. that's what happens, you know. And, and I need to say one other thing. We always put the best stuff on because we want people to see the best stuff. We want you to right. come. We want you to see this great stuff we have. So we put the best stuff on mm-hmm. and the best stuff sells quickly. So your best bet is to just come on a regular basis and look in person. Yeah, so 60% of all the people who shop in here are here at least once a month. I used to come in here all the time just to just to browse, just well, because, you know, it's so, so So one thing you need to understand about the antique and collectible business is it's fate. It's being in the right place at the right time. Coming in on a regular basis and having a dealer being in here that morning and bringing something in that you were looking at. Because I'll tell you what, if it's good, it's not gonna last. Mm. So fate is the key in this business. If you come in on a regular basis, you're gonna find stuff. I see something over here I wanna ask you about. Yeah, yeah, Um, sure, feel free. So there's this piece of, I don't even know what to call it, but it it looks like a piece of pottery. this, This is stoneware. Okay. okay, and back in the 1800s, they used this for jugs and crocs, and they would paint them. Let me to just make tell, them give, give people an overview. This is the jug that you see. If you go into a Woodstock, Connecticut house, pretty much every single house in Woodstock will have one of these 
it's a stoneware jug and it's yeah. usually up a, holding a door open yeah. <laughs> and it's a decorative piece and uh, so tell us a little bit about it. So. so this is a floral okay the blue painting on the front is floral it's a four it's a four gallon and it was made in Fort Edward New York okay and they stamped this one okay why are these so common like why do people love these things so much because they're decorative and they're beautiful and and You've you've stepped on another one of my obsessions. I have a huge collection of these. Oh yeah. Oh my god. It's, I a, have birds, it's a thing floral. around here. Oh, it's huge. Yeah. And and it's wonderful, okay? Um and they're hard to find in really good condition. Oh, and they're here, almost impossible. Here's to find the reason really why. This is a beauty right here. So a few things would happen. One thing would happen is, is that people would leave fluids in these. And over the years, the fluids would leach into the, the stoneware mm -hmm. and because the, in, the outside is glazed, but not the inside. So if stuff was left inside it, it would discolor from the mm -hmm. inside out. So you would have this brown line here. Mm -hmm. The second thing that happens with these is this. So they took these and they would fire them. So they, they'd make them in this, in this stoneware and then they would glaze them and they would fire them. Okay, but here's the interesting thing in New England. In New England, the earthenware, because of its hot and cold and dry and humid, the earthenware moves. The actual stoneware, the stuff that's inside moves. Mm -hmm. But the glazing does not because it's solid, it's firm, mm -hmm. which causes it to crack and pop and have issues. So the fine ones really nice are harder all the time. This happens to be a beautiful floral one. It's wonderful. If I didn't have a bunch, I'd want it from my collection. Now, I'm sure if anybody's listening to the podcast that, that has seen one of these before, they'll know what exactly I'm talking about when I yeah. say it's got kind of a beige-ish. gray. beige gray. And then the, the floral design on the front is like this, what do you call that, blue? It's always blue. It's always kind of this deep, deep blue that's used because the deep blue popped really well off the gray. And when they fired it, it stayed. So to me, it looks like a tannish gray yeah. with the with the blue floral design in the front. That's just kind of a whimsy type of design. But you see these all over the place, and they're a huge collectible item. How much is something? This is about uh, what is it? About a foot and a half tall? Yeah, maybe. And, uh, he now he has three and a quarter, three hundred and twenty-five dollars on this. Then you you would say to yourself, "Boy, that's a lot of money." Mm -hmm. But to the people who know what this is, oh, that's a rare item. Right it's there. not a lot of money. Now you don't see beautiful ones like that. Now, there's a beautiful one over here. Let me show you this one really quick. Because this one I love. And if I didn't have a couple already, I'd have this. <laughs> this is a bird. Oh, yeah. Okay. And this is a wonderful thing. This is from Hartford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. It's a Bosworth. But they did a bird on, on a limb, on a, on a tree. So now this is not a jug. This is more of a... This is a crock. Crock, okay. Okay, so, so you would pickle cylinder. in this. Yeah, you would pickle in this. And the bigger you are, you might do sauerkraut in them. Um, you do your pickles, you do all your, that type of thing. In there, so I was, okay? Yeah, I was always just kind of curious, why is it that they're so commonplace when you see people that collect things that around northeastern Connecticut, those are one of the most common things. What are some other really common things people collect or put around their houses? I'm trying to think of other antiques. You, see, you know what, actually there's some, uh, there's some antiques that I can think of. Let me take a look over here real quick. Is it empire that I'm thinking of? I always hear the word empire. Well, empire is a furniture. Okay, so okay. it's a, it's a company? It's, it, no, no. It, Empire is a style of furniture. Okay. It's very bold, <clears throat> okay, and it's very, everything is big about it. Mm. The legs are big. Everything's big about it. Yeah, big round tops. Yeah, them. yeah. Right. yeah we we're talking about yeah, the same yeah. thing. Yeah, now the Empire market is, 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 to be very honest with you, kind of soft, as well as East Lake, which probably doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people. I've Oak. heard that name also. Yeah, yeah. so, so that, that, that older style furniture is not what it used to be. And having said that, if you like that style, if you like East Lake, if you like Empire, if you like all that, now's the time to go after it because mm. the prices are down. I have a, a house time. for sale in Thompson right now. There's there's some antiques in that house and I'm curious to see um, how much they're worth because some of these pieces you can tell just by looking at them. These are so, classics. So let me throw you one other thing that yeah. I do a lot yeah, of, sure. okay? I get calls all the time from real estate agents and attorneys. So the house is being downsized. The, pre the parents have passed away. The kids live someplace else. The kids don't have interest in the contents. They call me first to go in to ascertain if there's any value. Mm -hmm. They don't know if anything's valuable. They don't want to pay a house cleaner to come in. Most people wanna... are like me. They have no idea right. what's they valuable. They don't want to send them off to an auctioneer and just say, hey, whatever you give me, you give me. They want to know what they have, and that's my job. And I get, I do very well by, by doing that. I go in and I look at things all the time. I do artwork. Um, Monday, next Monday morning, I'm going into a house full of art that I have to look at to ascertain if it's, it's valuable or if it's not valuable. 
So how does somebody make an appointment with you that they just call Antiques Marketplace? Yeah, they and, call me at the shop. And ask for and we, Rick. Yeah, ask for Rick, and, and we talk about it, and I, I ask lots of questions. And what's the phone number here? Oh, the phone number here is 860-928-0442. And you can call and ask for me, um, and uh, they'll put you on with me, and I'll speak to you, and I'll ask you some questions, and I'll get an idea of what you have. Um, a lot of times, people send me photos on my phone. I do that. I how, go. How far do you go from uh, Putnam, Connecticut? I try to travel no more than an hour. Hmm. That's my goal too. Yeah, but having said that, I have some good dealers. That I have one that lives in Hebron. He'll travel for me. Mm -hmm. So he's one of my best dealers. Um, and I send him the houses all the time. And he'll travel down to East Hartford. He'll travel to West Hartford. He travels a long way for me. And um, that works out really well. So, so what, how does the process work? So somebody calls you to make an appointment, you to go take a look at what they have available. Yeah, yeah. And then what happens from there? Well, so, so here's the thing. Anyone who's selling to a dealer should expect... 50% of the retail value if they want to sell to a dealer. Mm -hmm. Dealers usually mark their items up 50%. Mm -hmm. That's just how it works. So whatever they buy them for, they're going to retail it at twice what they bought right. it for. Right. So if I walk in and I see an item in your house that's worth, let's say, $1,000, mm -hmm. you should expect me to pay you $500 okay. for that. Yeah. Now, sometimes that works out for you. Sometimes it doesn't. There's lots of options that you can do. You don't always have to sell to a dealer. You can try to sell the items yourself. You can put them in auction. My, my issue with auctions right now is most of the items selling at auction are selling at wholesale. That's what I've been hearing is that the prices are pretty Plus low. Plus right you now. end up paying a 20% auctioneer fee. Okay. So you're actually not doing as well as selling to a dealer. Interesting. But sometimes you have a lot of things that you can't find dealers who want. You have to do whatever you have to do. Let's take a walk over to the coin section over here. Sure. So you have some watches, you have some silverware, and we're actually already over the, um, we're at one hour and five minutes, so we should probably try to wrap it up pretty soon. But is there, you'd like. are there any other important items that we should talk about that you have here at Antiques Marketplace other than the there's, coins? There's and such a varied. It's just never ending. We could, yeah. we could, yeah, yeah, we could three go on hours. for hours. Yeah. There's such a varied amount of product that there is something for everyone here, and that's kind of what is important to me. You, you, if you walk through this store, you are going to see jewelry. You are going to see pottery. You are going to see toys. You are going to see Disney World collectible pins. I know that sounds crazy, but they're a huge market. What about really <clears throat> rare items that you can only find here? What about if somebody, what about Rubik's Cubes? Are they, like they're, from the original, they're no, probably no, no. not they're, worth they're anything, not, right? They're <laughs> not very desirable, but you will find Civil War things. You okay. will find an 1865 uh, Abraham Lincoln Stevens <laughs> graph bookmark. You will find... Okay, so super no, rare, real Oh, super antiques. rare stuff. You will find a pennant and the paperwork from the second ever airplane show they ever had which was 1910 it was in hard so movie memorabilia oh there's everything you think of hmm. we have movie people come in and buy stuff all the time if you're familiar with the tv show that's now done called the americans they bought a bunch of of um of medical items from hmm. us for one of the episodes okay. we see movie and tv people all the time i've sold literally I sold a huge set. I got a call one day from New York City from a woman that says, do you still have that Civil War toy soldier set? And we said, yeah. She says, well, I need it for a movie. I'm coming up from New York City now. Hold it, Maureen. How did she me. know you had it? Was she, she had been there? up the week yeah. before and saw it. They take photos. They go back to the producers and the directors. They show them all the stuff, and they say, yay, nay. And then they call us, and they come up and get it. It sounds like you have a collection of clocks around here somewhere. We have clocks all over okay. the place. Clocks and things are interesting. Yeah, I hear all kinds of uh, chimes. Clocks over there. Let's go this way for a second. Come. All right. You know, uh, the owners of Victoria Station Cafe have their house for sale right now with me. And um, they have this piece in their kitchen that's got to be a collector's item. I don't know much about antiques. And take but take a look at all these clocks. Oh yeah! Wow. Yeah, yeah. No, so. we have a Dana. Uh, we have a, a dealer here called Dana. Mm -hmm. He's an expert on clocks, and he buys lots of them and he sells oh. tons of them. What's Dana's last name? Swanson. Oh, okay, I thought it maybe was the same Dana. He's a great guy. Interesting. Okay, yeah. great. So, uh, and then there's a there's a cash register yeah, here from. Just, I don't yeah, even I mean, know it's how. It's just amazing the interesting stuff you're going to find in this place if you walk along. And you walk through here. So, so you take a look at a case like this. It is extremely eclectic. So this, this is a this is about a six and a half 
seven foot tall case that's about four, yeah, feet, four wide. feet wide. And there are one, two, three, four, five shelves in yep, there. With there a... There's everything here. And this is what I love about this eclectic. So there's everything here from early Halloween plastic to condom containers from the 20s. What? Uh, look, Ramses. <laughs> I, mean, do you, I mean, you can see the extremely um, a wonderful Pedro cut plug. This case, there's 20 people who would have interest in this case. That's interesting, yeah. And okay. that's kind of the way it is. Milk bottles. Uh, Milk bottles. Jewelry, sewing, uh, shaving. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing what you find in this shop. So um, people can get more information by uh, stopping in in person at Antiques Marketplace in Putnam, Connecticut. Or Facebook. Or Antiques Facebook. Antiques Marketplace or Facebook Jeremiah's. Antiques Marketplace or Facebook Jeremiah's on Facebook. And uh, what, can you give us the phone number again if you'd be allowed sure. to? Sure, 860-928-0442. And how about an email? Should they just get that? Yeah, my email is pretty cool. It's called Rick's Cool Stuff, R-I-C-K-S-C-O-O-L. S T U F F at hotmail dot com. And I've been using that for twenty years and send me photos or contact me with any questions. In my opinion, information is free. You want do you want to know about something? Let me know, and I'll look at it, and I'll tell you what I think. You may not like what I think, but I'm going to tell you anyway, and people send me photos all the time. I'm inundated. It's wonderful. How far booked out are you for appointments if somebody wanted to have you come out and take a look at what they have? Right now, my, my book through next Monday, so I'm usually a week or so behind. Not too bad. So not if, too bad. So I've if, gone more, but I, I've learned to kind of delegate to people, too. Do you work with other auction houses in the area, or how do you... Um... How do you... If I, if I do a whole house, if people mm -hmm. want me to do a whole house, I'll go in and look at the things. I might purchase some things, and then I'll bring an auctioneer to finish it up. An auctioneer, and then they also could potentially do a clean-out, because I'm sure those oh, things go together. Like, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And it depends on the type of product you have, because there are auctioneers that handle different types of product. Mm. Just, just, you know, if you have more higher-end, then we're not going to use a lower end auction house we want a higher end auction house how do people how do you know if a house is going to have value so i could call you, you up at, i have to walk in and look and i have to look at everything and i come in and i walk through and i look at every piece of furniture i take i take drawers out i turn it around i look for mm. different things it's really hard to tell you because it's like being a detective. There are clues that tell you things. And to give you an example, I was in a house in Norwich a few weeks ago, and the people had, they wanted me to look at all their furniture. So my wife and I go and look. And as we're looking at this one piece of furniture that was made of, you know, early 1800s wood, I noticed that all the nails were round, had round heads. Well, in the early 1800s, they didn't have nails with round heads. They were all square-cut nails. Mm. So what we discovered is that someone had taken this, either taken this piece apart and put it back together, yeah. or they fabricated it with old wood. Mm. It was one, yeah. So it really was old. The wood was old, but it wasn't old. Mm -hmm. And that makes a difference. So it's all in knowing what you're looking at. They had cupboards that had square nails on the outside, but when you open the doors... The, the cross braces were round nails, mm -hmm. and it was painted on the inside with a new paint and not an old paint. So there's a lot of things to look at to recognize. Mm -hmm. The amateur, no insult meant to amateurs, they don't know. They look at it and go, oh, that's beautiful. It's an antique. Half of them probably don't even really care. If it looks, if it looks nice, they cool. just, they're happy with it. Right? Oh, and I'm, yeah. I'm totally cool with that. <laughs> but when I'm, well, you're selling me an antique and I'm supposed to be a buying it. A real antique, antique collector I, would know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, they, and, and they do care. Yeah, and they do care. So yeah. I have to care. Yeah. Um, the joke about the, the Rubik's Cube, uh, eventually they're probably the, the 80s things are going to be antiques at well, some, some point. Some of the like 80s are saying. coming along, like you know Transformers in the toy market. There's some 80s things that are pretty some strong, believe it or not. Pac-Man arcade arcade oh, machines. Oh my and God, stuff. arcade machines are great if there's, you can get them. There's a place in Providence called the, the Fett Music Hall that I went to go see a concert about a, a month and a half, two months ago. They have an entire arcade full of all the classic arcade, full stand-up arcade yeah. games. I thought it was awesome. And they're all free to go play. So you yeah. can take a break from the concert and go out there and play some video games. It's awesome. I, I have a gentleman <laughs> next door that a, a few months ago he ran into a Dracula um, a, a game, mm -hmm. the electronic game, but it didn't have any legs on it. So what do you do with that? He made it into a coffee table. It was totally awesome. <laughs> and he sold it right away because it was so cool. I looked at it and said, are you kidding me? But he was really creative. And he made this into a coffee table that worked. It was a video game 
that worked and he made it into a coffee table. It was that awesome. Is, that is interesting. Yeah. Um, so just back to the thing about going out to people's houses and taking yeah. a look at it. If I go through houses as a realtor and I know that this house has a ton of stuff in it, I don't know if it's valuable or not valuable. Would it be possible for me to record a video with my phone, walk through the whole house, upload it to YouTube, make it a private video and send you a link to it so you can take a look at it and determine whether it's worth you to come out? Yes. It's worth it for me to come out. Yes. Mm -hmm. But actually worth what the items are. No, right. because I really need to see things in person, but I have people. So, so I need to say this. I never say no. Hmm. I never say no because you, you, you have to understand the one rule of thumb is this. What you think is valuable probably is not. Mm -hmm. And what you think is not valuable probably is. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds crazy, but that's the way it is. So people call me. I'm, I'm not matching real estate agents, but I have two or three in the area that call me to almost <laughs> every house. And I go and I look at them and say, yay, nay, not good. Call, this, call the auction house. He'll come take care of it all. Mm -hmm. um, and I identify value. Now, having said that, the one thing that has really worked for me over the years, if I walk into your house and I'm looking and I see a painting on the wall and that painting is, I believe, is worth $10,000 or expensive, I put you in touch with a really great auctioneer. That'll, and I don't mean a local auctioneer. I'm talking about Skinner's or Julia's or one of those that really handle high-end stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't get a piece of the action. I get nothing for it. What I get is a really good rep and you sell me the other stuff or whatever. And I do that all the time. Hmm. And it works great for me. I'm totally fine. If I find something wonderful, I love it finding it wonderful. And I recommend you need to sell it through this guy. He's going to take care of you and you're going to get more money and you don't want to sell it to me. I know it sounds crazy mm -hmm. and it sounds like I'm killing my business, but I'm actually not because it has actually given me more business over time. You know, one of the, one of the things that I always wanted to do with this podcast, and it sounds like what you're saying is um, the lessons that you, people can learn from your experience. That's, that's what I wanted to get out there was the people that are successful in business and the things that they've done over the years and the things that they've learned, if they have any advice that they can give to people. So what... I wanted to do this podcast for a long time. It just so happens that I got into real estate and I, I found a way that I could connect with people on a level that you wouldn't normally be able to connect with them. And I'm using the podcast for that purpose because now I feel like I know you really well compared to how I knew you a yeah, week ago. I got it. I got it. Um, but, but at the same time, I feel like years ago, I, I kind of set a goal for myself that someday I would be able to interview people and learn, get advice from them. What do you, what could you tell to the people that are just getting started in the business? If you could look back 20, 30 years uh, from when you first got started in this business, if you could give yourself a piece of advice that would help you get to where you are now, what is the, is, is there one thing? Is there some advice that you can I, I give I don't to know. People? I think if there's one thing, but I think the most important thing is to keep an open mind. You can listen to anybody you want, but you know what? In our business, you got to go with your gut. You got to go with, you look at something, you say, I think that's good. And if you think it's good, somebody else is going to think it's good. So you sometimes have to figure that out, who that person thinks is going to be good. I, I'm full of stories, but this is a quick one. I did a house in North Grovendale for someone and we were talking and she asked me to look at the furniture in her bedroom. And I looked at the furniture. She was a little old lady, very nice French lady. And I noticed that on her her bureau she had a picture of her and another gentleman on a late 40s harley davidson so i said oh cool you guys are in the house she goes oh yeah she said, i still got all our jackets and our clothes from all those years she said we rode motorcycles till 54 till my son i had my son so i said you still got them she goes yeah so i look at them and i go wow these are cool all these harley clothes and jackets and her husband had made this wonderful harley outfit for himself and it was all studded and it was black and orange and it had harley wings on her back and it was wonderful i said i gotta buy it what do you want and we i bought it and i took it home but here's the one thing i didn't realize they were little french people he was only five one so I had this wonderful Harley outfit that I thought was great, but it only fit a person who was five foot one. So what am I going to do with this Harley outfit, right? I finally realized, I didn't actually, my wife, Lori, realized we need to sell it overseas. And I literally sold it to a person in Korea. Because, no, and I know that sounds crazy. That's, no, it's great. But, right, yeah. but the, the point was, is it was a wonderful thing, mm -hmm. but I had to find a place to sell it. Yeah. And you have to go with your gut. I knew I liked it and I got it. But then I was like, the next step was, okay, where do I sell it? Just out of curiosity, actually, that brings up a good question for me too. Um, what are some of the most 
high price items that you've ever sold or you know can you think of anything off the top of your head that oh, was just sure. like this really rare thing that you've never yeah, seen before yeah 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 i i sold well to the mash and tuck at pequot museum oh, wow. they have a surveying book that i bought it was it, i found and it was uh from 1854 and um it literally has the first surveying of their property wow from 1854 all colorized pages it was wonderful it was wonderful, and I loved it. I also, one of the other thing, favorite things I sold, I sold to the Army Museum, and that was there was an ambulance corps in World War I, uh, but they were all volunteers, and most of them were conscientious object objectors, but they wanted to do their part, so they worked in the ambulance corps. And there was um, uh, the gentleman who was the, the colonel, whoever was in charge of the ambulance corps, wrote all these rules and regulations up, and he had this little pamphlet he created for all his drivers and all his people. Mm -hmm. None of them exist anymore. I found that along with the dog tags for a gentleman who was an ambulance driver. And they bought it from me. And I thought it was so cool to have this one-of-a-kind thing that they've never found before. They knew existed, but they never found it. And I was able to find that and, and give it to them. I also had... I also had the first known, the earliest known photo of the Ohio State University baseball team. I had an 1891 photo, which was the first year that Ohio State recognized baseball as an, uh, an Ohio State event. The first year. How did you find that? I found it in-house. So it was, it was an estate? It was an estate sale. I yep. went to, yep. And people, people had all these photos and stuff. And I said, wow, those are cool. And I bought them. And um, what's what's the typical price range of a, of a would you say it was a high priced antique that something in here like some of the more expensive items in here is that something you want to talk about? Well, it's maybe... not that. It's just that there's <laughs> there's no really set price on anything. Okay. okay. So to give you an example, the Ohio State University photo mm. that sold to an I I sent it. I sent a photo to Ohio State and they certified that yep it was the first year 1891 and they didn't have one they had the 1892 but they didn't have the 1891 and it was the very first year um so you found a buyer for that because you knew who it would be important well to. they found an yeah. alumni who was willing to buy it for the school oh neat yeah 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 and they spent hundreds of dollars for it i yeah. won't tell you exactly <laughs> but they spent a lot a lot of money for it he spent a lot of money yeah. for it to donate it to the school Interesting. And it yeah. was a wonderful thing. And I love finding those special onesie things mm -hmm. because you will not find them again. The only problem is for people like me who are collectors, mm -hmm. it's really hard to part with those things. Mm -hmm. It was really hard to part with that photo, let me tell you, because it was totally cool and I knew I would never find it again. Well, thank you so much, Rick, for being on the podcast. No, it's, 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 it's a, we could just go on forever. So we, could, we should probably revisit this in a few months. If we listen to this and we say, we wish we would have talked about this and we wish we would have talked about that, you know, or we could just come, come back. Whatever you'd year, like. Well, whatever you're going to be do. back here because you're going to do a virtual tour That's from right. me now. I'll at least do a part of it, at least like this main area sure. here to, sh to show off, to see if sure. it's something that you think might be useful for the rest of the place because this is a lot of square footage. Yeah. But um, So anyway, thank you so much uh, for being on the podcast. I I totally appreciate you coming. Thank you. <laughs> and I and I appreciate it. It's an honor to finally meet with you and talk oh, to good. you. And um and I hope that we can do this again down the road. Yeah, yeah, um, me too. So um I don't know how else to say it, but uh you know, if you could just maybe give uh, what's the what's the street address here actually? Oh, I'm too? sorry, one oh nine uh one oh nine Main Street. Okay. And Jeremiah's is twenty six Front Street. And, downtown Putnam. In Putnam, Connecticut. So uh, if anybody's interested in stopping by. And what are your hours during the week, too? Okay, so we are 10 to 5 every day but Tuesday. We're closed Tuesday. Every other day is 10 to 5. We're open all weekend. Why Tuesday, just out of curiosity? I know that sounds crazy and everybody asks the same question, but in Connecticut, we have Monday holidays. Mm -hmm. And Monday holidays are very busy days for us. Mm. So we've decided that... If we were closed normally on Monday, mm. but we had a Monday holiday, it would be just too confusing for people. Well, that's interesting. So, yeah. So Monday holidays are huge big, big days for us. Labor Day, New Year's Day, all those are huge for us. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Rick. You're and uh, I just want to give a little bit of information about myself to anybody that's listening who doesn't know who I am. Uh, my name is Anthony Shabbat, and I'm a realtor with um, Shabbat and Associates Real Estate Group of Keller Williams in Central Massachusetts. But I live in Northeastern Connecticut. I do both Central Mass and Northeastern Connecticut commercial, residential. And I'm also a real estate photographer. So I do real estate photography, drone videos, virtual tours, floor plans and podcasts, web design, TV production, you name it, I do it. If it has to do with marketing and real estate, I've done just about everything there is out there. So uh, you can reach me at 508-847-0902 and um, shabbatandassociates.com. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast, everybody, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>